Hi everyone, welcome to video lecture 11, the last in the series, and today we are going to examine ASEAN in its external legal relations. In the previous 10 seminars, we basically looked at how ASEAN as an organization deals within itself, right? So now we are looking at how ASEAN member states as a regional grouping deals with the external world. In this video lecture, we are going to look at two types of external relations. One is the general kind, where let's say uh, ASEAN will work in the international fora, such as the United Nations or with other le uh, international legal persons. And the second uh, domain that we will examine is ASEAN in its external uh, legal economic relations. So the econ um, ASEAN working with its external uh, trade and investment partners. So to recap, in this video lecture, we're looking at two types of external legal relations that ASEAN conducts, the general type and the economic type. So the key themes and issues surrounding ASEAN external relations are these, right? We need to understand which areas in which ASEAN external relations occur. They occur in every domain that ASEAN wants to deal with. Although I mentioned that we are only going to look at the general type and the economic external relations, but there is a huge variety of ASEAN external relations. As mentioned, there is the economic front where we can use soft and hard laws in um, these economic relations. Obviously, there is security. There's also sociocultural type of external relations. And we use cooperation instruments to, you know, uh, conduct or to construct these external relations. Then the next thing is, who does ASEAN conduct external relations with? I mentioned in the previous slide, we're looking at international organizations and um, trading partners or investment partners, but mostly ASEAN as a whole will deal with its dialogue partners. So they have 10 dialogue partners. ASEAN has 10 dialogue partners, and I list them out here. Um, the US, Australia, New Zealand, China, of course, Korea, and Japan, obviously. And as mentioned before, foreign relations with international organizations, right, such as the UN, the European Union, and obviously other bilateral uh, relations with um, other countries in the world. Now that we know that there are various types of ASEAN external relations and who these external uh, parties that engage with ASEAN are, we need to next know what are the guiding principles for ASEAN external relations, right? So what are the issues involved? What are the principles? What are the motivating factors for ASEAN to want to pursue these sorts of external relations? And when ASEAN engages as a bloc, you know, in external relations, what are the guiding principles that keep all 10 member states to the same page. One of these principles are, as we have seen in the ASEAN Charter and in the literature that we have studied before, is ASEAN centrality. So we need to understand what ASEAN centrality is. We see it in Article 41.3 of the Charter. The ASEAN centrality idea is, you know, the driver's seat, um, the main mover in external relations, what type of behavior, communal identity, what sort of unity are we projecting, right? And because ASEAN can engage with external partners, external parties, this means that ASEAN really exercises its legal personality, as we see in the 
uh, Charter Article 3. Now, how do we determine whether legal personality exists? We need to see the type of action that ASEAN conducts. Right? We have seen some of legal personality in the previous videos, but today we examine this as an issue in itself. So in terms of ASEAN external relations, yes, we do say that ASEAN engages with external parties, but we need to really drill down and see, does ASEAN act as one entity, right? Does it act as one entity or as a collection, as a collective of 10 states? That's, that means that it's a member state driven organization, right? And obviously, when ASEAN engages with the rest of the world, the same ASEAN way norms apply. Informality, does this still happen today? Or is it a more formal type of external relations? Yeah. So we need to also see the types of law that govern ASEAN's external relations. We have the Charter and the 2011 Rules of Procedure as well as the types of uh, ASEAN external engagement uh, institutions. So we have the ASEAN plus type of arrangements, the ASEAN plus three, which is uh, which comprises the three uh, Northeast Asian states, China, Korea, Japan, uh, East Asian Summit, or the ASEAN Regional Forum, which is uh, a security forum with ASEAN members, dialogue partners, and uh, other states. So why are external relations so important for ASEAN? What's the rationale for ASEAN conducting external relations, right? The EPG again tells us why ASEAN needs to engage with the rest of the world. We, looking back in ASEAN history, we know that friendly relations are very important to the peace and security of this region, right? And not only for peace and security and stability, but stability will provide a good environment for us to pursue our economic development. So ASEAN does conduct external relations through dialogue partnerships, the ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus 3, ASEAN Plus and the East Asian Summit. These are just examples. There are other types of uh, external relations that ASEAN conducts, but these are the main ones. And all these external relations will help to um, manage, will help ASEAN manage its transboundary challenges such as um, natural disasters, terrorism, transnational crimes, maritime security, you know, energy cooperation, pandemics in the middle of it all. That's us. Now, what else does the EPG say about you know, ASEAN external uh, partnerships? So in, our, in paragraph 51 of the EPG report, the EPG says, emphasizes that all major powers are ASEAN's dialogue partners. So it's very strategic. Do we choose, you know, states which are not so important to ASEAN or do we choose states? whose power and whose influence are very strategic and critical to, you know, the prosperity and peace of ASEAN, right? The type of external relations that we conduct, we need to maintain non-discrimination, equitable, you know, practices among all the participating members, um, and ASEAN needs to retain centrality, right? So even in the midst of um, engaging with external partners, ASEAN wants to maintain centrality. It should be the driving force, you know, in the driver's seat, right? And so what does the EPG report, uh, recommend? Empowering the Secretary General, you know, because to build up ASEAN, ASEAN will have to participate more in the international community. So the EPG recommends to empower the Secretary General to represent ASEAN's interests 
and to devote more attention to nurturing cooperation with our 10 dialogue partners, sectoral dialogue partners, and you know the other international persons in the world order. So who are the other persons, such as the UN, right? And then they reiterate the regional processes, the important regional processes for external relations, the ASEAN Regional Forum. And the EPG reiterates, in any form of ASEAN external relations, paragraph 53 says, ASEAN's interests must be paramount. We need to speak with one clear and authoritative voice. So 10 member states, one clear and authoritative voice must be projected outwards. Regarding the Secretary General's powers, the EPG says not only to, you know, court or um, further ties with dialogue partners and international organizations, but the EPG says in paragraph 37, it's not only diplomacy that Secretary General should conduct, but the Secretary General should have delegated authority to sign non-sensitive agreements on behalf of member states. So this point I need to emphasize. It is a delegated authority from the member states. So member states devolve or you know delegate this authority to the Secretary General to exercise the will of ASEAN centrality of the 10 member states. Yeah. So from the EPG report, we see it all melding into the charter in Article 41. How does ASEAN, as a treaty obligation, conduct its external relations? So 41.1 says friendly relations, right? And ASEAN shall be the primary driving force. ASEAN needs to have centrality, develop common positions, pursue joint actions. You know, the strategic policy directions uh, emanate from the summit upon the recommendation of the foreign ministers. And then we need to see ASEAN concluding agreements with countries or other organizations. And these procedures will be, you know, in line with the 2011 rules of procedure for the conclusion of international agreements by ASEAN. Yeah? Now, in the way that ASEAN conducts its external relations, we need to see the status of external parties. As mentioned before, you know, before the Charter, we had all these relationships, but the Charter solidifies them, you know, concretizes them into obligations. So in Article 44, we see that the foreign ministers may conduct the formal status of a dialogue partner, sectoral dialogue partner, development partner, special observer, guest, you know, to any external party. The foreign ministers have this power, right? Again, even if external parties do not have formal status, they may be invited to join, um, you know, participate on sidelines of ASEAN meetings or other cooperative activities as long as they fall within the rules of procedure. So just to give us a quick recap of the content that we have seen so far, what is the exact scope of ASEAN's external powers, right? External powers of engagement are both political and legal. We can see the legal and treaty making, but it's also diplomatic, right? Developing friendly relations, mutually beneficial dialogue, cooperation and partnerships, right? And there are obviously strategic uh, levels of partnerships. Not everybody can be a best friend, right? So dialogue partners are obviously higher on the priority uh, list. 
The types of issue coverage we need to see, it's not just confined to the three community pillars or to trade or uh, you know, development or security, but it's very, very broad. As we mentioned before, there are other cooperation areas, smaller ones, and there are also other cooperation uh, partners, smaller ones, but they're not dialogue partners. And then the priority modality and the fora, as we need to keep in mind, is that there's always ASEAN centrality. ASEAN must always drive the external uh, relation matter. So we see this in the ASEAN plus relationships and the ARF and the East Asian Summit. So why does and why can ASEAN do so many things on the global plane, right? So it can engage with different um, countries, different organizations, all these international engagements that ASEAN does. It's because it now has this new quality. In Article 3, it is legal personality. The puzzle that we have is, who represents ASEAN in the international arena? Is it the voice of the member states? Or is it the voice of a unified ASEAN as one entity? Or, you know, an expression of the Secretary General and the Secretariat? So we will explore this second question more closely. As mentioned, we need to understand Article 3. Article 3 confers ASEAN with legal personality, and this is in 2007. So it's not a trick question, but it's an important question. Before the 2007 Charter, did ASEAN possess legal personality? Right? Arguably, it did not in both law and in fact. But then we also need to examine, is ASEAN a real legal person now? So what is this definition of international legal personality? We've examined it before and in the readings that we will explore further, is that international legal persons hold rights and duties, right? And for an international organization that is an international person, it has a distinct legal personality, a distinct form that is different from its collection of member states. And because of legal personality, this organization or this legal person can enter into binding agreements on the international plane, it can sign treaties and it can be sued, right? So how does this international legal personality come about? There's the will theory and there's the objective theory. A will is that the member states intend it as such. So we see Article 3 there, right? They confer that the, the organization legal personality. The objective theory is that it's not only or not just about what member states want or what the member states say, but objectively, factually, the international organization possesses these traits that make it seem as a strong international legal person. So the Brownlee's test, Brownlee has a test of international legal personality. Brownlee was um, the top um, legal advisor of the UK government, and he has this test of international legal personality. It says He says that it needs to be a permanent association of states equipped with organs. It needs to have distinct legal powers and purposes from its member states. And these legal powers need to be exercised on the global plane. So based on Brownlee's test, is ASEAN's legal personality meaningful? It may seem quite limited, right? Because ASEAN still enters into agreements, not as one entity, not one organization, but as a collection of member states. 
If you take an ASEAN agreement and then you flip to the back page where all the signatories are, you will see that it's not the Secretary General who signs or it's not, you know, signing for ASEAN, but it's all 10 member states that have inked that treaty. So in some ways, the pre and post charter legal personality status seems to be quite similar, right? It doesn't really, this doesn't really affect, um, you know, the legal position where international rights and duties are concerned, but it does have some, you know, legal and political implications in the event of um, a lawsuit or the credibility as an international legal person, right? There are other indicators of collective personality, you know, uh, international legal personality. You can send and receive international envoys. You, um, the Secretariat um, holds itself as a treaty depository. It can uh, lodge international lawsuits, right? If we want to see a greater exercise of international legal personality by ASEAN, we need to examine the 2011 Rules of Procedure. Um, this is being used and ASEAN does refer to this for the conclusion of international agreements, um, but ASEAN still very rarely concludes um, ASEAN only type of agreements. If we see that it's rare that, you know, ASEAN as one signatory signs an agreement with another external party, what types of, you know, external legal relations does ASEAN conduct? Cremona and her colleagues have examined six modalities of ASEAN external relations, right? Three on each side. There is a collectively ASEAN type of modality, but when you flip to the back page, still all member states are parties. Huh? And then on the other side, another three, we see ASEAN as party and it's generally a single entity. So let's go into this a little bit more. The collectively ASEAN type of agreements, the primary example we see, and this is the most common, is when member states conclude these treaties or instruments or even declarations individually. And some of the examples are the 2003 ASEAN-Japan uh, Framework uh, Cooperation of Economic Partnership, the 2010 ASEAN-China Air Transport Agreement. Um, there are many types of, you know, 10 signatory uh, types of instruments. And it's not only in the economic sphere, but many collectively ASEAN instruments are found in the political, security, and sociocultural um, domains. There is another type of collectively ASEAN uh, instrument where one member state concludes on behalf of all member states, but this doesn't happen anymore. It was a very long time ago, a pre-charter. Huh? And there's also, you know, the Secretary General concludes on behalf of all member states. It's not so common nowadays, but there is um, some example, such as the 2007 uh, ASEAN Secret uh, Secretariat China MOU on Agricultural Cooperation, or the 2009 uh, ASEAN Secretariat China MOU on NTS, right? Um, here we see a delegation of authority to the Secretariat to sign. When, let's look to the next um, category, the next three, ASEAN as party. So this is like ASEAN as single entity signing up to other instruments. So the 
classic example, ASEAN is a single entity. This is a 2005 ASEAN-US Joint Vision Statement or the ASEAN-UN Joint Declaration on Disaster Management. The Secretary General concludes on behalf of member states another UN type of agreement or an ILO agreement and another type and yet another type. The Secretary General concludes on behalf of ASEAN Secretariat, right? So this is where um, ASEAN Secretariat inked an MOU with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So we can see on this map, or rather this chart, where you know ASEAN does act as one entity, ASEAN acts as a collective of 10 entities, and they sign instruments that are both treaty, hard law, and soft law. Right? In these types of agreements, where are the rights and obligations that we are trying to seek? Right? Or and if we cannot enforce these legal rights and obligations, does this mean that these instruments are weaker? There's a reliance on goodwill and reciprocity. And does this also mean that these instruments may have weaker credibility? All these things are issues to bear in mind. Yeah. And because, you know, we come to the critical heart of the issue, if ASEAN has legal personality and wants to sign agreements with external parties, then is, it calls into question how good is ASEAN centrality in the face is of all this, right? If you are so central and speak with one voice, should an ASEAN sign as ASEAN rather than all a collection of its member states? And if it still signs as a collection of its member states. Is this enough to be the central driving force in external projects? What are the implications of acting collectively? Right? It is difficult to act collectively. All 10 member states must be willing. It takes time to negotiate, right? Consultation and consensus. So what Cremona and her team have examined is that, sure, even if ASEAN signs off as 10 member states, we cannot say that it dilutes centrality because signing off as ASEAN member states when they examined all the instruments is still rather significant. It sustains ASEAN legal personality, but there is no strong separate legal personality. Okay, right? So there's ASEAN legal personality, but because it's still a collective of 10, there's no strong separate legal personality. And because it's very difficult to be seen as one, there's no ASEAN foreign policy. So, you know, in sensitive areas, it is always the individual member states foreign policy. Again, maybe ASEAN faces this question or, or external parties also face this question. There is the issue of responsibility. Who answers when things go wrong? Right? So if ASEAN members all 10 sign an agreement and the agreement is a provision of the agreement is breached, who bears the cost, right? If an ASEAN member state has breached, is that ASEAN state solely going to bear the duty of reparation uh, and also maybe to suffer potential countermeasures? Yeah. But more likely, the difficulty will come in when ASEAN or ASEAN states are injured by the external parties breach. How? Do we then, you know, go after and claim reparation? How do we convince the rest of the nine that an injury to ASEAN has occurred? You know, if it's one member state of ASEAN that has been injured, maybe it's easier to invoke the, the creed of individual state responsibility. 
Apart from binding agreements, we are looking at soft external law, right? And so what's the importance of soft law in ASEAN external relations? There is still merit, even if we think that they're not treaties, not legally binding, because it keeps ASEAN in the game, right? If you have declarations, you want to engage big powers, everybody is signing up to some commitment, even if it's not an obligation. And through these soft external laws, ASEAN does manage to get leverage, right? And ASEAN, when they conduct these declaratory discussions or instruments, you know, adopt them, it might also be a preference of the foreign external parties, right? Because they want to dialogue with ASEAN, but they may not want to be bound to a treaty. They, you know, if you discuss sensitive issues, you want to have soft legal commitments. So again, the same issues come up. When ASEAN conducts, you know, external relations in the form of soft law, we need to understand centrality, other norms of the ASEAN way, who the dialogue partners are, and in what fora do we engage our external partners. The issue coverage is very broad, very cross-sectoral. These are all issues that ASEAN member states or in ASEAN as a whole engages in with its external parties. Now we come to ASEAN external relations in the trade domain, ASEAN external trade agreements. In general, when we saw in the previous slides, ASEAN external relations are conducted over political, security, economic and sociocultural matters, right? And we see an exertion, exercise of international legal personality. Now we come to something firmer, more substantive, more concrete. And these are ASEAN external trade agreements, trade treaties. And obviously we know that trade treaties, ASEAN external agreements are very, 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 very important. All these statements regarding RCEP, CPTPP, ASEAN type of uh, you know, external trade agreements, these are seen as critical, paramount for ASEAN's prosperity. So where are the issues? The same issues recur in ASEAN external trade relations as with general ASEAN external relations. Centrality, where the rights and obligations, the objectives of ASEAN member states when they sign up to external trade agreements, do we get, what type of practical gains do we get? What types of agreements do we use? And how do we assert our sovereignty? Then, apart from rights and obligations, we also want to enforce our obligations, right? Enforce, make sure that we get the gains or others may want to enforce their rights against us. So make sure that there are gains for all parties involved. How does enforcement happen? Should it happen through dispute settlement mechanisms like arbitral panels or monitoring implementation uh, mechanisms are better. If in trade, um, external trade agreements, we're also looking at ASEAN the ASEAN minus X formula, what are the pros and cons? Because not all ASEAN members are at the same level of development. So even if an external trade treaty has been signed, some member states may go ahead first and some may wait till uh, a few years later. So what are the pros and cons of exercising ASEAN minus X, right? The limits of those going first is that not everybody gets the gain of the entire block of 10. What the types of trade agreements do we see? ASEAN has signed with China, Korea, India, you know, New Zealand, Japan, there is now the new RCEP and obviously the CPTPP, yeah? RCEP is ASEAN plus five dialogue partners. 
And also there's the argument that external agreements may foster integration. Um, we will have more connected global value chains. We, external trade agreements may give ASEAN members better benefits, um, may compel better institutions, monitoring and better rights and obligations. So the types of models that we see are uh, in external trade relations are plurilateral, combined and common. Um, there is a subset of demi-common, but this is not so relevant in ASEAN. So ASEAN, how do ASEAN external trade agreements tie in with you know, regional economic development? We remember the AEC seminars where trade and investment are very important to ASEAN, right? So there are economic priorities. These have not changed. So with the AEC, that's intra-ASEAN, then ASEAN sign, also signs up external economic treaties. China, Korea, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah? There have been other free trade agreements, the ASEAN EU FTA, but that has stalled. And there's also the ASEAN Hong Kong FTA, which has, you know, has been concluded and it's been ratified. And I think it's in force. So apart from this, there is obviously what trade lawyers know as the noodle bowl. You know, there are, despite these multilateral trade agreements, there are still bilateral agreements, separate agreements by some ASEAN member states with external partners. So what are the issues? Driver seat and centrality, right? How do ASEAN states manage to speak with one voice? And also there comes in a practical question, should ASEAN enter into these external trade agreements as a single entity or as a group of members? Which one is more favorable to ASEAN? Which one is more favorable to the individual ASEAN member states, or which type of agreement, you know, uh, should be more beneficial to the ASEAN external parties' interests? Yeah, and when violations occur, who is responsible, and how do we redress it? Another question, big question, is how do external trade agreements facilitate regional economic integration? So we need, as mentioned before, we need to use the ASEAN minus X carefully, right? If the X number is small, so let's say eight member states are willing to go ahead and two will join up later, that external trade agreement is quite optimal, yeah? Not fully optimal, but not bad, better than nothing. But if only three ASEAN members go ahead and seven will join up at varying stages in the future, then this will really dilute the quality and effect of the external trade agreement. So there needs to be careful use of ASEAN minus X, right? And what types of obligations do these external trade agreements assert? They, is it against the member state or is it ASEAN member state against ASEAN member state against external partner or maybe even ASEAN as one entity versus the external partner? The fourth category of the ASEAN secretariat versus the external partner is more hypothetical, but it's possible, right? And of course, external trade agreements could facilitate regional economic integration via better implementation and enforcement. Because if we have external trade agreements with very large dialogue partners, you can be sure that there will be strong external pressure to make sure that ASEAN integration carries on and complete. So this is a chart of the type of external trade agreement modalities, I just want to concentrate on the plurilateral, the most common, right? It's 10 ASEAN member states signing up to a trade treaty with the dialogue partner. It is 10 plus one signature. 
it is not one ASEAN plus dialogue partner signature, right? What are the advantages? It can hasten integration, but there are problems in the enforcement, right? There may be loss of strategic control if there are too many uh, voices. And if one party defaults or there are certain parties that default, then this could trigger interstate dispute settlement or undermine, you know, um, intra-regional amicability. Yeah. Some of the examples are the Austra uh, ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, FTA, and then the ASEAN, Japan uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The combined modality is a bundle of bilateral agreements. I will talk about that briefly. It is not used yet. It's a hypothesis, but it is arguably an idea that you know the ASEAN EU FTA is trying to pursue because an ASEAN EU FTA could not get off the ground. The idea is to use a bundle of bilateral agreements starting with the Singapore uh, EU. Singapore EU uh, FTA and then the Vietnam EU FTA and then the process is to get a bundle of 10 bilateral agreements and then compress them into um, an external trade agreement of the region vis-a-vis -vis the EU using that as an example. The common modality is not used, right? The exercise of collective competence, so ASEAN as a single party vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the external economic partner, um, this is really quite difficult to achieve because it entails a high level of unity. Yeah, and demi-common is used in other regions of the world, but it's not used in ASEAN. So how can we enforce, right? So we have those agreements, external economic agreements, and how do we enforce them? Reporting monitoring, or should we use dispute settlement mechanisms? Looking in greater detail on the ASEAN minus X formula, yes, it helps us or helps ASEAN to move into its external economic agreement more quickly. But because not all 10 are in the agreement, it does undermine our single market and production base and our goal of integration, right? So there needs to be greater solutions, such as, you know, used as a last resort, or maybe we set a limit for X, for example, keep it to three, so that major the agreement can go ahead with the majority of ASEAN members, yeah? Um, there could be partial applications of the ASEAN minus X to certain clauses of treaty, not blanket application to the entire treaty, so on and so forth, right? Looking at responsibilities, who is responsible when there's a breach of an external agreement? And this is really problematic, yeah? Not really been triggered yet, but something to bear in mind because we do have many external economic agreements. If ASEAN state has breached, yeah, there is a duty of reparation and the potential to suffer countermeasures. But again, as we, we, we saw before, the difficulty comes in when it's the external partner that breaches or violates the rights of ASEAN, ASEAN member states. How do we get restitution? How do we, you know, put things right? So looking at the landscape of, you know, ASEAN external agreements, ASEAN um, external economic agreements, what type of model, what model do we want to choose for ASEAN agreements? Should we go for the plurilateral type? or a combined type, or even the common type where it's one entity. All these things are subject to change. As ASEAN's international legal personality strengthens, we may see, you know, a single entity type of 
agreement um, becoming more prevalent. Yeah. So all this would depend on how things develop in ASEAN, depends on ASEAN and ASEAN member states' intentions, to what extent ASEAN desires to be central, to what extent does ASEAN wish to have legal personality, and of course, moving into the future, what type of legal and political structure of the region and the individual ASEAN member states, what legal and political structure do we have, right? And what degree of integration we want for our ASEAN community. And last but not least, the regional and national capacities to make sure that we carry out, we sign, we conduct our external legal relations in a proper manner. And with that open-ended question, we come to the end of this video lecture. It has been a pleasure to have all of you and we will discuss the questions more fully in class. Thank you.